Warning, this podcast contains violence, sexuality, gore, and other horrible and disturbing things. Listener discretion is advised. Also, the hosts of this venture are ignorant dipshits, so please do not take anything they say as fact. And enjoy the show. Now, are you sitting comfortably? Good, then we'll begin. Today we had 15 homicides and 63 violent crimes, as if that's the way it's supposed to be. The atoms in your left hand probably came from a different star than your right hand. It is our basic human right to be fuck up! A second plane now has crashed into the other tower of the World Trade Center. Put chemicals in the water that turned the friggin' frogs gay! The defendant shall be incarcerated for the rest of her natural life with no possibility of parole. You are not machines! You are not cattle! You are men! We were somewhere around Barstow, on the edge of the desert, when the drugs began to take hold. Hold. Oh, very Hello, occultists, and welcome back to Occulte Veritatis Podcast. My name is Leon Filger, along with... Sage Murray! Ood Gallifrey! And in studio with us... Steph! And... Richard Bigley. Today we're going to learn how to make homemade napalm out of garbage bags and gasoline, but first, Ooh. what's your poison? <laughs> so, what's your poison? Probably something comparable to garbage bags and gasoline. Probably. What do we have today? Pass them around, guys. Yeah. Uh, this is the uh, Bacardi Breezer oh, wow. watermelon so berry flavor, <laughs> a rum mixed drink. Talking mm-hmm. about sweet stuff, hey? Yeah. Mm-hmm. By the way, um, thank you. Uh, every episode we get something with the credit card. I just thank the patrons. Um, it's thanks Ooh. to you that we're able to buy this booze to drink every episode. I could get so fucking hammered on this so fucking fast. Oh, it goes down so easy. Put that on ice. Uh, that's candy, like candy in a can. Yeah, like that's candy. Candy. I don't know. <laughs> like this. This is the breakfast. You're funny. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. The breakfast cereal of the Nest Creek Music Festival. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't been to one of those yet. Me neither. I need to go. I, I, what? I, I need. I need Guys. to go to. I want. Okay. <sighs> In the upcoming year, I want to go to a Craven or a Nest Creek. Not or something. a Craven. No, no craven. craven. No, no craven. craven. Okay. You've been, you've been shouted down. No craving. Shot down. Okay. On the very last day, once everyone is gone, some people leave their tents behind. Oh. And some funny. people do this for various reasons. Sometimes they're shitty tents no one cares about. I ended up scoring a really fucking sick, like $800 tent a couple of years oh, ago. Shit. Oh. They just didn't want to bother packing it out. And sometimes people will leave like all their possessions there and just walk away from it. And there's a lot of weed to be found in those tents. <laughs> <laughs> Can you like, imagine being that rich? You yeah. could just like say, fuck like, oh, it. Fuck don't it. don't feel like it today. Yeah, I don't want to take my shit. Oh, that's the dream. Yep. <laughs> a few years ago, we found a dead person in a tent, though. Oh. Holy fuck. Yeah. Jesus. Like, it, as soon as you found them, did you have to leave them alone and just make the call? And I, I don't know. This is like well before my time, but mm. from what I understand, it was very obvious to whomever found them that the person was in fact dead. <laughs> it was not a call to 911. It was a call to the coroner. Oh, goody. And I think it was determined they just fucking died of heat exhaustion inside a tent on a hot day. Oh, how, that's awful. How long were they there for? Well, could have been three days. No one had seen them in a while. But what? heat exhaustion's a fun death. Like, it's you get kind of nauseous for a bit and then you die. It's fine. One second. Could be worse, Oh, right? could be yeah. way worse. Yeah, you could fucking die in a space capsule. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's well into second felicity. So there would be, after 48 hours, there would be some skin slippage and there would be a definite scent uh. of rot. So, yeah. Anyway, yeah, that's what they found. I don't know if they kept the tent or not, but I would have. Oh, uh, we did. We did an episode on what happens to the body after death. So oh, I had the neat. notes. Okay, cool. he just doesn't have like death facts. For I was death. very curious as to what kind of notebook that was. <laughs> oh, like, it's his death book. I, I'm gonna make this a tradition. Every time I fill one of these up, I'm gonna raffle it off to a patron. So. Oh, that's fine. And I, I think I'll have like maybe one more episode left in this one. So yeah. It tastes much less chemically than than the last like one we had on the space disasters episode. Yeah, the Smirnoff ice. <laughs> I don't know. I was kind of worried because I'm not really a, a watermelon fan, but uh, this is artificial watermelon. It's hardly so all it's that okay. watermelon either. It's not like a double bubble watermelon. <laughs> it's mostly berry. Yeah. 
I don't know. You could probably throw it in like your your cereal if you ran out of milk or something. Um, you know, <laughs> I, I, I think I'd probably put this in instead of my usual uh, can of beer. Uh, <laughs> shut up! I call it burial. Um, anyway, um, the thing is, he's not, he's not joking in the slightest. I've known Richard Bigley for fifteen years, and he absolutely puts beer in his cereal. We well, should. What kind of cereal, though? Uh, you name it, Frosted Flakes, oh, anything. Fruit Loops, Cinnamon Raisin Toast Brand, Crunch. Cinnamon Toast Crunch, whatever. Hey man, Richard Bigley, next time you come to a recording, that's going to be a... A poison? Yes. <laughs> oh. I, I want it to happen. <laughs> lucky Charms. I, I, I want to well, knock it. Are I want to try lucky it before awful. I knock it. Who knows? I'm going to have a new disgusting love. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm going to rate this uh, 1971 uh, out of... Uh, 2016. Oh, wow. That's two numbers. Yeah. <laughs> oh, by the way, somebody on Patreon, the, the last episode we put out, you gave the thing a normal rating out of oh, 10. Yeah. Oh, jeez. Multiple people asked if you were okay. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> no, I just slipped, I guess. That was pretty funny. <laughs> Valid question. Yeah. yeah, I mean, we were like shell-shocked from like Sage's fucking episodes. So. Yeah, that, <laughs> it, that could be it. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> The cop is a phenomenon unto himself. He's a paranoiac. He's a megalomaniac. He can be a sadist. He can be vicious and cruel. He can be nice and sweet, especially if he wants something. He can break the laws that he pretends to be enforcing with impunity. He is very sensitive to being called names and tends to react the only way he knows how. He is armed to the teeth with clubs, chemicals, gases, firearms, and the most frightening weapon of all, righteous indignation. He tends to be stupid and uneducated and very aware of his shortcomings, although he doesn't appreciate people's comments on them. He travels in packs or gangs and feels a certain degree of security when he is with his own kind. His word is taken without question in all courts, and he relies on this. When unarmed and confronted by a police officer, you must take all these factors into consideration before deciding what course of action you intend to follow. Most individual confrontations between police and individuals take place in the street. If you are black, Puerto Rican, or white with long hair, you can expect this. Cops have the legal right to stop and frisk any person in a suspicious circumstance. Suspicious circumstances are solely the cop's interpretation. He can always bust you for something like disturbing the peace or disorderly conduct and then throw in a resisting arrest charge. I can fully appreciate the fury and anger that a person can feel when put through a humiliating experience by a cop, but I would recommend strongly that a person maintain his cool and in no circumstance lose his temper. If you lose your temper, you are playing right into the cop's hands. The cop will probably ask you a bunch of questions, name, address, what are you doing, where are you going, etc. I would suggest that you answer all his questions, although you are not legally bound to. In no circumstance should you answer any questions about drugs truthfully, unless you have none and have never used them. By refusing to answer questions, you will antagonize the cop and probably get yourself busted for loitering or refusing to obey a policeman's orders. Be polite and concise, but do not give any information that is not asked for, and in no circumstance use anyone else's name. It is a good idea to refer to a cop as officer, since it helps his ego and enhances your chances of staying out of jail. Cops may go further than just harassment. They may actually assault you. In these circumstances, you still have no legal right to defend yourself. In these conditions, stay calm if possible. Do not attempt to defend yourself other than just cover your groin and head. 
If you see an opportunity to grab a nearby weapon and are reasonably sure that you can be successful, then defend yourself. But never forget that a cop has a gun, and he has used it and will use it. When confronted on the street by police, a common emotion for a person to feel is fear. There's nothing wrong with this. In fact, it's quite healthy. But do not show it to the cop. If the cop realizes you're afraid of him, he will take full advantage of the situation and play on your fear. This doesn't mean to act belligerently, and for God's sake, do not be a high school or college lawyer and explain to the cop what he can and cannot do. He can do anything. He's got the gun. Okay, so in 1971, a book was published called The Anarchist Cookbook. Yeah. Mm, sounds like something that uh, you'd expect out of like a Food Not Bombs group or something, you know? Uh, hold on, we're getting to that. <laughs> there is Food Not Bombs. Oh. Uh, just hang on. <laughs> Written at the height of the American counterculture opposition to the war in Vietnam, it was one of the most controversial books ever published, more so than the Holy Bible, which is very controversial because unlike the Anarchist Cookbook, which has some real bits, the Holy Bible is 100%. Bullshit. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so sassy. <laughs> As you do. <laughs> in its 160 pages are recipes and instructions for concocting in one's garage everything from heroin to tear gas to homemade hand grenades. The first 25 pages of the book, which measures a full 8.5 by 11, contain a preamble about anarchism, Marxism, and Maoism in the United States. Yeah. The book's stated audience isn't fringe political groups, but rather the silent majority of individual Americans who might find themselves in need of overthrowing their government. Awesome. <laughs> uh, Now's the time, kids. Now yep. is the time. Uh, the Anarchist Cookbook's author, William Powell, expressed tremendous regret in 1976 for writing the book upon converting from anarchism to Anglicanism, which is a weird segue. <laughs> I was just going to ask, how did how did that happen? I don't know. I, I don't know. And I couldn't find any info on it. But Well, like, one's a religion and one's a political It seems ideology. to me Anglicanism is something you, like your family is born with and you leave eventually if you do change. Anglicanism isn't something you like stumble into and you're like, holy fuck, the vicar's right. No, <laughs> not generally, no. No. He attempted to have it removed from the shelves of mostly revolutionary and counterculture bookstores, but the book's publisher, Lyle Stewart, told Powell to go fuck himself. That's fair. As you do. Powell again renounced the book in a 2000 Amazon review, and finally in a 2013 opinion piece in which he hoped the book would quickly and quietly go out of print. It didn't, and Powell died of cardiac arrest in 2016. Aww. You know, we talk about the cliche of the skeleton in the closet. Well, my skeleton's not in the closet. My skeleton is in print. And I live with that. I really kind of reclosed myself. I didn't want to know. The last thing I wanted to know was that it had been used in some sort of escapade that had ended up hurting people. When was the first time you learned of a connection between an act of violence and the book? It was Columbine. I had no idea. Why would I make the connection? You had written a book about it, an instructional book. I'm getting the impression that you want me to say something I'm not saying. Do you feel responsible? If you're asking, do I wish I had done more? Yes. Allow the fear and the loneliness and the hatred to build up inside you. Allow your passions to fertilize the seeds of constructive revolution. Allow your love of freedom to overcome the false values placed on human life. Freedom is based on respect, and respect must be earned by the spilling of blood. I can remember writing that. And I remember thinking, that is a cool turn of phrase. Uh, yeah, I was pleased with that at the time. Um, now I think it's absolute rubbish. But at the time, it sounded really good to me. I can see that people might read portions of this book and 
find justification for doing very destructive and evil things. And that fills me with remorse. Uh, I first heard about the Anarchist Cookbook when I was in elementary school, circa 1997. Mm -hmm. At the time, it had been identified as the Antichrist Cookbook, and the older brother of a bully in my class was an alleged owner of a copy, though this was never confirmed. And really, Antichrist and Anarchist are not a whole lot different. (laughs) Where did you grow up? Where were you at that age? I went to Catholic school in Saskatoon. I was in Catholic school in North Battleford, and they called it the exact same thing. The Antichrist Cookbook? Yeah. Nice. That's incredible. I was in public uh, school in Saskatoon. We we called it the Anarchist Cookbook. Yeah, well, that's because you had a real education. <laughs> Where did I go to school? Because I literally never had heard about this. I think until when? No, maybe probably. within the last. Uh, when did you initially mention this to me? Like two weeks. Two weeks ago, weeks? I went and googled some stuff. I never yeah. had heard of it. Really? Oh. Yeah. And now you're like, on. I a love watch this list. shit. Well, yeah. So to be fair, I hung out with like the. Like the edge lord, like halfway emo ish kids in high school. So, so did I. Yeah. <laughs> I purchased a copy from Amazon in 2007. I subsequently put it on a shelf and didn't read it until last week, more than 20 years after first becoming aware of its existence. Christ. Uh, the Anarchist Cookbook is one of several anarchist cookbooks in circulation, including the 624 page 2005 bestseller, Recipes for Disaster, which is now in reprint. It's published free of private copyright by a group calling themselves. The Crime Think Action Faction. Cool. Yeah. I greatly prefer it to the original Anarchist Cookbook in that it contains piles of information on protesting and infiltrating organizations in addition to the potato and the tailpipe recipe section. Mm-hmm. The copyright of the Anarchist Cookbook never belonged to its original author, William Powell, but rather to the publisher, Lyle Stewart. Stewart kept publishing the book until the company was bought in 1991 by Stephen Schragris, who decided to drop it, although not forever. Mm. Um, out of the 2000 books published by the company it was the only one that they ever decided to stop publishing Uh, they said publishers have the responsibility to the public and that no book like this has any positive social purpose that could justify keeping it in print the copyright was then bought in 2002 by Delta Press an Arkansas based (laughs) publisher that specializes in controversial Mm. books where the title is their most asked for and most popular volume At the time of its publication, one Federal Bureau of Investigation memo described the Anarchist Cookbook as, quote, one of the crudest, lowbrow, paranoiac writing efforts ever attempted, end quote. (laughs) High praise. Yeah. (laughs) Guess they haven't read Twilight. No. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, yeah, shade, shade, shade out there. Advocates of anarchism. Anarchism. Anarchism controversy. Controversy. Too Too much water, melon breezer. (laughs) <laughs> um, advocates of anarchism dispute the association of the book with anarchist political philosophy. The anarchist collective Crime Inc., uh, which publishes the aforementioned Recipes for Disaster in response, denounces the earlier book, saying it was, quote, not composed or released by anarchists, not derived from anarchist practice, not intended to promote freedom and autonomy or challenge repressive power, and was barely a cookbook as most of its recipes are notoriously unreliable. End quote. <laughs> and some of these notoriously unreliable recipes include the following, taken directly from the book that's sitting in front of me. <laughs> this is a fun topic. I'm glad you chose it. I think just, I'm going to buy that book. Yeah, it's just a little book of fuckery. How much did you pay Drugs. for Drugs. <laughs> Drugs. Okay, Heroin. so this is, this is kind of fucky. Like, um, Canada's just legalized marijuana and just legalized the home cultivation of marijuana. So I thought I would, for the benefit of our Canadian viewers, read a little bit from chapter one, drugs. Uh, under pot, <laughs> it says, quote, pot, grass, or marijuana is available anywhere in the country. First of all, that's bullshit. Like, do you know how hard it is to find weed in the States? I know I've lived there. It's hard. Oh, yeah. And that's in a, like a, a legalization state like Washington. It's still hard to find drugs. That's wild. Yeah. I mean, you can find them in the big cities, but like trying to find weed in the country is impossible. Oh, yeah. Over the flyover states and all that? Yeah, no, no way. Anyway, it says it's available anywhere in the country as the black market is widespread and thriving very well. Now, this was written in the 1970s, so the weed they were actually finding wasn't really weed at all. They were kind of smoking industrial hemp. If there was like 23% THC shit floating around in 1973, there'd be a bunch of people in jail who oh, wouldn't yeah. otherwise mm-hmm. have been there. Oh, fuck yeah. I, I mean, that, that's... Drug growers, please stop making it so strong. Like, just focus on the subtleties of it. Don't, oh. don't just try to knock someone the fuck out. 
Do, it's, it's not fun. It's not fun. It, like, let me let me say this clearly. I'm 33 years old. I don't enjoy <laughs> smoking weed anymore because it's just too strong. <laughs> it's too like I've I've switched onto CBD almost exclusively because I'm just too old to be high all the time. Like, <laughs> I I have a baby now, and I just that takes precedence over. Getting high all the time. Okay, yeah. but I don't have a kid, so am I okay then? Oh, yeah. No, you can get high all the time. Excellent. If you've got, like, I mean, we've got school to worry about, but you can do that high. I do it better high. Yeah. Psilocybin. Yeah. Yeah. Legalize it. Whenever, Psilocybin, I need, yeah. whenever I need to release focus when I'm researching for the podcast, I'm always just, like, out of my mind on sativa because I can just monofocus like a motherfucker. Oh, yeah. yeah. Like, I can just, the dist- distractions go away. Anyway, skipping forward to care, it says very little care is needed after this stage with the exemption of fertilization. For fertilizers, one can use manure, soluble nitrogen, nitrate of soda, sulfate of ammonia, or rotting garbage. (laughs) To produce a stronger plant, one can clip off the lower leaves. Do this only when the plant reaches a height of at least three feet. Three feet! Mm -hmm. That's a tall-ass marijuana plant. Well, the the thing is, that's two feet. Like, More than that. No, because yeah. like, that's like yeah, like a fr- fruit, a fruit like by the foot. foot. <laughs> fruit by the foot's not a foot, though. <laughs> no, it's three feet. And see, that that's why... It's like this log. That's why the growing laws in Canada don't really <laughs> cater to my needs, because indicas are really short and bushy, and sativas are tall and tree-like, yeah. so I can't legally grow my favorite kind of weed. And the, the ones that they've, like, bred to be small and bushy are kind of bullshit. Oh. Uh, I, I, I haven't found a real good one yet. We haven't planted any plants yet. If you if you want to go in on like chemicals and stuff like that, like yeah. ha- have it and all that, like I I've, I've read through a couple of books. I'll I'll help grow you some healthy plants. Yeah, like I would be in for that. Yeah. yeah. What about? Hi, I'm Daphne Gottlieb, and I'm at City Lights Bookstore in San Francisco. I am reading the Table of Contents from The Anarchist Cookbook by William Powell. It was written in 1971 to protest the U.S. involvement in the Vietnam War. And it was challenged because it gives you instructions on how to blow things up. In particular, you can blow up yourself because it's written so poorly. But, you know, be that as it may, this is all the things you can learn. Chapter 1. Drugs. Pop. Peyote, psilocybin, DMT, bananas, amphetamines, amyl nitrate, cough syrup, blue, naline, cocaine, heroin, nutmeg, paragoric, peanuts, hydrangea leaves. Two. Electronics, sabotage, and surveillance. Electronic bugging devices, microphones, bumper beepers, voice-activated tape recorders, electric bug detection, electronic jamming, electronic scramblers, mail order and retail electronic outlets, broadcasting, free radio, telephone and communication sabotage, other forms of sabotage, three. Natural, non-lethal, and lethal weapons. Natural weapons, hand-to-hand combat, application of hand weapons, hand weapons, knives, impromptu weapons, brass knuckles and clubs, cattle prod, garrote, guerrilla training, pistols and revolvers, holsters, rifles, semi-automatic and automatic weapons, shotguns, converting a shotgun into a grenade launcher, silencers, how to build a silencer for a pistol, how to build a silencer for a submachine gun, bows and arrows, chemicals and gases, how to make tear gas in your basement, defense and medical treatment for gases. Four. Explosives and booby traps. How to make nitroglycerin, how to make mercury fulminate, how to make blasting gelatin, formulas for the straight dynamite series, how to make chloride of azode, formulas for ammonium nitrate compounds, formulas for gelatin dynamites, how to make TNT, how to make tetril, how to make picnic acid, how to, formulas for black powder, how to make smokeless powder, how to make nitrogen triiodide. Formulas for different colored smoke screens, household substitutes, safety precautions, basic formulas for demolition use, some important principles, tamping, placement of charges, bridge destruction, detonators, release of pressure, detonators, time delay devices, road trap, walk trap, Bangalore torpedo, Molotov cocktail, homemade hand grenade, how to make an anti-personnel grenade, book trap, door handle traps, loose floorboard trap, Gate trap, chimney tramp, lamp tramp, car trap, pipe trap, pen trap, whistle trap, and other handy devices. Cacodial, postscript, bibliography. For extra credit, book trap. Figure 105 depicts a book trap. To construct this, you will need a large book, perhaps a thousand pages. The book should be hollowed out, leaving the edges intact. 
in this hollow place, put a dry cell battery in your explosive and connect the wires. Fix two metal contact points to the edges of the book and separate them with a wooden wedge which is attached to the rear wall of the bookcase. This must be accomplished in such a manner that when the book is removed from the shelf, the metal contact points will touch and complete the electrical circuit, thus causing the detonation of the explosive charge. So anyway, like the anarchist cookbook, the original one is a lot of bullshit because I'm looking at this one, the chapter for explosives and booby traps. <laughs> None of this shit's realistic. Like napalm with garbage bags, not happening. That that's not. I'm not a, a chemist, but that's fake. Yeah. You can't make napalm like that. You can make napalm out of gasoline and garbage bags, but it has to be the right kind of garbage bags that'll break down in the gasoline to turn it into a gel. Yeah. See, but this is more, I think, towards people that are like me that are don't know that. Oh, and you're just getting And I'm just stu- Holy I'm just fuck, this stupid awesome. and I'm like, that looks cool. And like <laughs> I will try to do like if somebody wrote a book about it, I'm going to assume that this is legit. And like right. test it. And, and I'll and test and it out and I'll try shit. Like just stuffing a bunch <gasps> of garbage bags in a jerry can at the if they the say service that that's the way there. to do it, cool. I'm probably gonna do it. <laughs> okay, so Sage is pointing at uh in the chapter on explosives and booby traps, what's called a book trap. Book trap. Uh, it's one paragraph and reads as follows. <laughs> Figure 105 depicts a book trap. To construct this, you will need a large book, perhaps a thousand pages. Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Yes, yes. Holy Bible. Yeah. Holy Bible. We yeah. got one back there. Yeah. Like I have one at my dog's age. I have a textbook <laughs> that's about that long. Yeah, we do have one, don't <laughs> yes. we? Runner? <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. Medical surgical nursing. It's okay. my favorite of our... No, it's not. I can't read textbooks. The print is too small. Yeah. Like I have that learning stupidity yeah. where I can't read the smaller and Brunner and Potter Perry are both bad because the text is like fucking font size eight. Yep. And I, I can't my it just glosses over when I try to read it. Yeah. It's, I don't know what you do. It's one of those it. old people magnifying glasses. It doesn't help. It doesn't. No, it's just it's is, so overwhelming with words. Is there an ebook version? Because you can like Ooh. increase the font size on the there e-book. is, but the, you know how much the ebook costs? One hundred and twenty eight dollars. That's, That's probably cheaper the than the book, textbook. though. Yeah. yeah. But but if it if it actually allows you to read it, then that'd be a good you know transaction. I would say. Yeah, I mean, if you want to pass school, which good I point, guess I yeah. do. Yeah. No, I mean, I you're paying the tuition. You may as well, you know. Yeah, no, I'm. I, I mean, I, I didn't. I won't say I fucked around in the first semester. I, I fucked around in the first semester because I've done all the classes already. I don't want to say I <laughs> fucked around in the first semester. I fucked around in the first semester. <laughs> I didn't try as hard as I could have, but like second semester is gonna be like real piss in the pot, right? <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna definitely I'm have putting to in more D effort. for yeah. done. All you oh, need is shout. D for done. Yeah. C's get degree. That is my favorite <laughs> saying, and that is what I'm rolling with. Yeah. Do you know what the difference is between the person who graduated first in nursing school versus the person who finished last in, first in nursing school? Nothing. They're both called nurse yeah that's what I thought. <laughs> pretty <it>. much <laughs> yeah. anyway so uh book trap book trap <laughs> book trap the book should be hollowed out leaving the edges intact in this hollow place put a dry cell battery what the fuck is a dry cell battery do we have those anymore is it like a car battery I oh we're, we're just talking. like uh, it. i think it's just like a regular Google. everyday like a regular battery. battery but they had to call it dry cell because they had two different kinds well wet cell would be like uh, like a car battery oh yeah fair enough but it says dry cell car battery Okay, oh. dry cell battery. Motomaster, uh, 85 and bucks at Canadian Tire. This is why it's so bullshit, because it says, um, the book should be hollowed out, leaving the edges intact. In this hollow place, put a dry cell battery and your explosive. What explosive? Where do you get this explosive Maybe from? Maybe he talked about it in the beginning. Uh, it's probably some, some fertilizer bombs, but you can't actually make that shit well, anymore. Potassium perchlorate, I think it's made of. Anyone know? Potassium nitrate? I'm not building a bomb unless my instructions come from Ted Kaczynski. Kaczynski. Yeah. Other than that, yeah. I'm not. I'm not um, listening. <laughs> he made. I mean, he made some good bombs. He really did. He had a damn. Mind you, you know who really had the biggest impact, if you will. <laughs> <laughs> Timothy <laughs> McVeigh. Yeah. <laughs> Blew up a daycare. He did. Oh, yeah. He did. Yeah. I think there's an episode coming out. Yeah. On that. All, yeah. yeah. We, we can maybe do it together. Yeah. I'll do the murders, and you can do the science. Fuck. Timothy McVeigh is a piece of shit. Oh yeah. yeah. Like. Last Killing podcast babies, did a good episode like, on man. it. He, he's the kind of individual that, like, the digger, the more you deep, the more fucked up shit you find. Yeah, yeah. Like, he's just like a garbage human. Yeah. Also, book trap is the name of my new rap rave group. <laughs> 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 okay, so fix two metal contact points to the edge of the book. Separate them with a wooden wedge, because you got one of those. 
which is attached <laughs> to the rear wall of the bookcase. Oh, so you need a bookcase for this. This sounds really <laughs> elaborate. <laughs> which is attached to the rear wall of a bookcase. This must be accomplished in such a manner that when the book is removed from the shelf, the metal contact points will touch and complete the electrical circuit, thus causing the detonation of the explosive charge. Cool. <laughs> Dang. I'll make a book trap. And you can do this shit, it says, with door handle traps, loose floorboard traps, gate traps, chimney traps, whatever's on the next page. Oh, wow. Lamp trap, car <laughs> trap, pipe trap, pen <laughs> trap, and whistle trap and other handy devices. <laughs> whistle? Do you have I to get them to blow on it? <laughs> How do you trick someone to blow a whistle? whistle blow trap. my whistle, baby, whistle, baby. Armor that <laughs> I don't know if I'm deaf. Please blow this in my ear. <laughs> the, uh, I don't know. Like uh, To me, it seems like a more effective uh, incendiary device would be like, like you take a 9-volt battery and you just push the two two contact points up against some steel wool and just let it sit there for a while. Yeah. And it'll smolder and then it'll ignite. And then if it's in a book, which I would assume would be paper and very combustible, on a bookshelf with other books, with other paper and other combustibles, um, you know, I, I think it would be very effective that way. Why can't we just shoot them? <laughs> why, why do we need... Thank you very much, Richard McVeigh. <laughs> oh. Because, <laughs> I was going to say, you sound like you've thought about this before. Why do we got this? Why do we got to do this cloak and dagger stuff, though? Yeah. yeah. Um, anyway, so, like, having read now the Anarchist Cookbook in its entirety, mm. um, I'd say save yourself the trouble. It's really not that exciting of a read. I'm if buying you try it. To, it's on order right now. I ordered it Did while you were talking. Me? Well, fuck. I, I haven't the, yet that's not impulsive at all. That is the <laughs> second official purchase live on the podcast. Yeah, I bought a, the the se- second key of Solomon yeah, on yeah, the yeah. podcast. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. should like autograph it or something, like all three of you, and then you can try to like auction it off on the Patreon or something for oh, some the anarchist cash. cookbook. Yeah, have, like all of you I sign my, it and I say, I have my you know, name stamped in the front of it. <laughs> you know, from like OV Pod, you know, say Jude and Leon. And then you can, you know, just raffle it off or auction it off or something. Books. I have so many duplicates of books. I kind of like having this book, though. I mean, yeah. as shitty as it is, well, you it's buy like, a different one. I don't have that kind of money. <laughs> but you will once your auction's uh, done. Ooh, smart. He yeah. did just buy two books for my kid. So <laughs> yeah. we're, we're having a f- Festivus b- book exchange with yeah. my children. Oh, I bought a book for his kid. Our respective children are exchanging children's books, and we write something really nice inside the cover. Yeah. Is that... I can't tell. Is it... No, that's really... Yeah, that's yeah. what it is. We're, we're, okay. Yeah. It is really nice. It's not like jokingly. No, no, no. It's, okay. it's actually we, nice we, we scheduled it for d- December 23rd. Oh, that's we're, we're, so sweet. We're going to have like a pizza night and... Have our kids exchange books, and it'll yep. be so cute. And oh, that is cute. lovely. And the guinea pigs will be there. Yeah, so wholesome. So we're, we're doing we're, it at uh, Leon's house. Yeah. You've not, you see, you didn't ever come into, into any of my study sessions. I didn't. You missed the guinea pigs. How yeah. many do you have? There's some two of them. cute guinea pigs. Have, oh. yeah. I kinda, I'm going to have study sessions next semester, though. I'm going to have to actually follow through. I think next semester is my... Because you fucking said twice. Twice you said you were coming. Yeah, then Neither did. time did you show up. Yeah, I, dick. I know, and I'm <laughs> bad for that, um, but like... And I was particularly looking forward to you oh. coming over because I'm like, everyone else is going to leave and then I'm going to offer you a joint. What? And it's going to be super tight because you're the cool kid in class. <laughs> and I was like... <laughs> I actually I it badly. <laughs> am not the cool kid. I'm the supervisor, if you didn't know. I supervise things. I got in trouble the other day for oh fuck supervising. Oh no! Okay. no By some like this bitch is, in my class. Here, hold I, on a second. Uh-huh. This is the this is the anarchist cookbook episode, but it's kind of short, so we're gonna throw in. We're keeping this in the episode. Mm-hmm. Steph bitching about. Okay, keep going. Yeah, Can, I it. can't say the name anyway. So can we give her a pseudonym? Your palate cleanser for tonight. Dum <laughs> dum. Dum dum. Dum dum McFuck face. Dum dum <laughs> McFuck face. She is our enemy. She is. And then I kind of then I kind of fell bad. I feel like my meanness anyway, okay. Let me just I'll yeah, start, let's start from the beginning. From so yeah, yeah. uh this started with an exam we had coming up and Leon didn't know what uh uh the learning the exam, outcomes yeah, what was it know. on. Yeah. yeah. And so somebody commented, these are the chapters or whatever you need to read. So then Dum Dum McFuckface decides she's going to comment. And she says, well, you know, if you just went back in and you looked at uh, the the outline that we got on the very first day of school, like you would know. And, and I'm like, rude. and I read it. Sno- I read it snooty, but I'm a petty bitch. I so I would, I would 100% read it snooty, too. And I was like, she's like, yeah, so you could go back and do that. And so he, Leon comments and he says, oh, well, that seems a little confusing. And so I said, well, why don't we just say chapters, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So then she writes back, oh, sorry, Steph. I was just trying to be helpful. Uh, you're always 
I'm so glad. What did she? I'm so glad you. I'm you're so always. Glad I have, you're have, I'm so glad I have a supervisor. Thank you, and you always know best. Whoa! <laughs> Whoa. Holy so beef! There's some shade. Yeah. May Val smite her. Yes. yes. May oh. Val smite. Yeah. And I was. So anyway, I I was my blood was <laughs> boiling, and I was pretty much ready. I had all these snarky comments, and I was and I wasn't even all that angry at this point. I was just like standing back, like um nom 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 nom. I'm so yes. excited. <laughs> like yeah, so I was ready to say something, and then. You know, my mom said, don't say anything. You know, be a bigger person, oh. Stephanie. So I decided what I do best is side eye, yep. grudge holding yep. for the remainder of my life <laughs> yep. and the silent treatment. Mm -hmm. So fuck you, yep. you know, and that's what I've been been playing with that. And then making loud comments about it so that yeah. she can hear me like, oh, I'm not trying to supervise, you know. Stuff oh, like I that. love it. So she, yeah. Yeah. Can I make a statement just yes, that please. like applies to everyone we know? Don't wait till you're married to fuck. Oh yes. my god! <laughs> like yes. we've got how many classmates who are on the I'm gonna wait till marriage bandwagon? I know, and I don't understand oh, it because um, I'm a firm believer in test driving the car. Test driving the car before you buy it. it. <laughs> yeah. I'm not gonna commit to a car if I, I mean, haven't driven it. No, and that's exactly how I feel. And so that, that's like you why I would at least fuck on the first the date. Exactly. I mean, you gotta. Yeah, you gotta. I don't know. I, I think men are feeling pretty objectified. We're not cars, ladies. <laughs> No, no, but like, I, I totally get it. Like, uh, this, this episode is definitely coming out after the BDSM double episode. So, like, <laughs> oops, sorry. So, like, like, as somebody who's, like, going into that world and learning a lot more about, like, his own sexuality and all that, like, it's not slot A goes into slot, into hole B and all that. It's, it's a puzzle piece. Like, it's complicated. And seeing how well you match up sexually with someone is this, I think it's just as important as emotionally and well, and, and, and I'd had a, a detailed conversation with one of my wait till marriage classmates, which hmm. surprised me because she like peppered me with questions about like my own sex life and like how young I was and shit, which I was, I was of course happy to explain to her because I'm, I'm obviously biased in favor of just try it before it. you buy it. Yeah. yeah. And just doing it. But Thank it's, you. it's one of those like waiting until you're married is a stupid thing for a couple of reasons. First of all, and primarily some people simply are not sexually compatible. Mm -hmm. Sometimes stick a does not fit in slot B. So yeah. it just doesn't work. Two people do not jive in the bedroom. Uh -huh. And now you've got yourself a marriage that you have to deal with for the rest of your life, potentially procreative because odds are, if you're waiting till marriage, you're religious and you're supposed to have kids yeah. and you've got to deal with that shit till you die. Mm hmm. I would say, so that's reason one, not to do it. Number two, sex is awesome about 30% of the time you do it with people. Mm -hmm. The other 70% of the time, it's regrettable, and you're like, fuck, I really could have done without that. I would say Whatever. my ratios are a bit no, different, but I, I, in general, I, mean, I, I agree. Don't, I don't shame myself for it. Like, if I think about, like, probably 70% of my sexual relationships would have been better off not. Mm -hmm. But then I would have oh, only had sex 30% of the time, and I would still, like... Stepping back now, I'm on my third marriage, um, and I've had several more sexual partners than that. Um, I think <laughs> you, I'm glad I had sex with everyone that I did before mm -hmm. so that I gained perspective on how great things are now. Well, yeah. Because, yeah. because of like walking into bed with Mrs. Leon Filger, if it was my first time, I'm going to have a fucking amazing time. And I don't want to say I would always be wondering if there was something better, but I think I would always be wondering if there was something better. Like yeah. you need to, mm -hmm. it's like, I've always said with jobs, like you need, if you, if you, if you get into a job, like straight out of high school that you love, you've missed out on a pretty important part of the human experience. Shitty like job. you need to work a number of shitty jobs in order to gain perspective on how great a good job really is and it's the same thing with sex well, yeah. you've got to have and and you will oh my fuck you will have bad sexual experiences you gotta fuck oh, yeah. a lot of frogs yeah you do you <laughs> find your brains yeah no it's it's gonna be terrible you are gonna you are gonna be terrible so yeah. basically what he's saying is you need to have sex before you get married yeah yeah so, so in a nutshell i mean in a nutshell and you have to have bad sex like screw it i'm here it is in a nutshell fucking you know? do it yeah. just yeah. Do, it, do it do it like yeah. You're not, you just do it. Just like sitting really. in the STI clinic with your fingers crossed, like, oh, come on, fucking please, not herpes, not herpes, not herpes. Yes, it's a rash. Everybody should have to go through that. Yeah, yeah. everyone should. And a pregnancy so, scare. Oh, God. Everyone God. needs that. <laughs> I mean, every, I mean, sex has inherent risk, but so does everything you do in your life. Isn't and that the fucking truth? Yeah. You, you have to decide, like, do you want to, do you want to act out your feelings with somebody? Like, do you want to hook up and see if it clicks? Like, you know, the world is shitty, and if you can get, like, a few hours of fun and a brain full of endorphins, like, that, it's, it's, I think it's worth it in the end. 
Anyway, oh. yeah. Oh, yeah. Go ahead, Richard Bigley. Oh, I was just going to say, so I, I assume that uh, polyamory would be right out for uh, for your classmates then entirely, too? What if you were married to both your partners in, in like, a polyamorous thing? Would that... I, I couldn't do poly. Like, I've, we have a classmate who's poly, and I couldn't I couldn't do it. We hey. do? Uh, we do. I'm poly right now. Is it you? <laughs> no, it's not me. Who? I'll tell you later. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Yeah, like, oh, like, so sorry. Get, get like, on that compressor. Like, I'm excited <laughs> like, for this. Out, out and Polly and has told me all about it. Well, that's okay, cool. Okay, actually, I. Yeah, she sits oh, behind yeah, me. She's freaky. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she is. Anyway, no, I can never Sometimes do Polly. You can t- somebody can tell there's a certain glint in the eye. And you're like, oh, yeah, she likes to get hit with stuff. Yeah, you like that. <laughs> wow. Wow. Um, that sounds like a recipe for disaster. <laughs> Speaking actually, of which. Actually, I haven't told you guys yet. This was, this was going to be a surprise. Oh, but boy. Um, you know why the table was pushed into the corner over here when you showed up? Oh, why? Jesus. Um, actually, oh, Jesus. one of my partners came over. <laughs> I got her to, we, we redid the disclaimer while I was spanking and whipping her. Oh, cool. Yeah, so those are going to be the disclaimers for the BDSM episodes. Oh, that's oh, fine. Oh, yeah. cool. I like it. Jesus. Yeah. I know. That's why the table was moved? Yeah. I but touched she, it. I've touched this table. No, no, no I, I didn't use the it. table. Yeah. I used, there, there's a boot box out there I was using. Oh, okay, that's... Okay. That's better. Yeah, that's uh, better. I thought that was gum underneath my chair here, but um, <laughs> can I get a Kleenex, please? <laughs> I was very careful. It's fine. Two women who were arrested in New York last week for allegedly planning an ISIS-inspired plot to use weapons of mass destruction against persons or property in the United States, that's the charge, may have gotten help from a book on the Internet. It's called The Anarchist Cookbook. The Anarchist Cookbook is a do-it-yourself bomb-making manual. It was written in the early 1970s by William Powell, a young American living in New York who was protesting U.S. involvement in the Vietnam War. Powell went on to disown the book and express regret that it had ever been published. But the book lives on in print, as well as in thousands, maybe even millions of digital copies on the Internet. Well, now Senator Dianne Feinstein says she wants that book, along with Inspire magazine, removed from the Internet, saying, quote, I am particularly struck that the alleged bombers made use of online bomb-making guides like the Anarchist Cookbook and Inspire magazine. These documents are not, in my view, protected by the First Amendment and should be removed from the Internet. Which, of course, is really not how it works. You can't just remove something like that from the Internet. But oversimplifications aside, I talked about this issue with Heidi Bogosian, the former director of National Lawyers Guild and author of Spying on Democracy. I asked her about the fact that in 1969, the Supreme Court ruled as public expression, a book can only be prohibited or punished if it is, quote, likely to incite imminent lawless action. I think the senator needs a refresher course in the First Amendment. Uh, She's wrong when she says that this kind of speech or written material is not protected. It clearly is because it's, uh, there are recipes, uh, instructions on how to make certain things, but it doesn't call for imminent action. These are not advocacy pieces and uh, they've long been held to be protected. There's a bigger issue here though, uh, in addition to the, the, the issue of free speech, an issue dealing with the FBI informant. Because if you go back to the criminal complaint that was filed against these two women. In November of 2014, the undercover FBI agent who was involved in this case told them that he or she had downloaded the anarchist cookbook. The criminal complaint states that the agent provided the text to the women. Fascinating that Senator Feinstein wants wants to ban the anarchist cookbook from the internet, but it's actually the FBI informant who was downloading it and distributing it. Correct, and that agent actually uh, folded over the page of this particular uh, instruction. I think this highlights a problem that we've seen increasingly since the events of 9-11, where FBI agents with really no transparency so that the public or legislators can judge how they operate, often prey on vulnerable people uh, and in many cases provide either the financing to purchase things from Home Depot or Kmart that ostensibly can be used for something like creating a bomb, but we don't know all the facts of how that led up to it. And we certainly can't trust the FBI agents' own accounts when often these are uh, inexperienced people getting paid by the FBI uh, to befriend, sometimes to have romantic involvement with young individual activists. And we've seen that in the environmental movement, 
Eric McDavid was befriended by an activist turned undercover agent named Anna, who actually gave him money and urged him on uh, to buy materials that could be used to support a charge of conspiracy. And jurors have later said that if they knew all the facts surrounding this, they likely would not have voted to convict. Uh, so it's a pervasive problem. Uh, the standard to prove entrapment is a very high and difficult standard. But certainly, we know that the FBI often preys on young Muslims who may have a sick family member and may need money uh, or support to, to help them out and may befriend these agents who use often coercive tactics. Well, and that is that really is the bigger issue because in addition to just going out and being able to find someone who will go along with uh, these plans, the fact that you can entice someone with money or in some cases being offered to buy cars for them and provide them with all kinds of material means, um, the FBI seems to be, be doing this and none of that seems to come out in the media. The other part of it, Heidi, that's important for people to understand is, is simply the fact that we have people who have no access, no means, no training, no ability in many cases to actually execute one of these terror attacks who were drawn in by an informant and then the FBI, I love in the press releases when they say the public was never in danger because that's the most truthful part of the whole report is that the public was truly never in danger from these people, were they not? That's right. And in this instance, with the two roommates from Queens, there was no specific target mentioned. And there was a lot of rhetoric on their part, which we often see and which we don't know uh, to what extent it could be actually to impress this undercover agent, because we know no facts about the person. Uh, in England, for example, we had many agents working uh, and Scotland Yard was sued by 10 women, where agents uh, infiltrating the environmental movement actually had romantic relationships with the women and fathered children. One of them, Mark Kennedy, is now in the United States uh, and has done work here. So the stories are complicated and are simplified in the media. We also see that they come out often before federal holidays or religious holidays when there's not as much news. So a terrorism story obviously garners a lot of attention. Now, that's a good point. The other issue that many people aren't familiar with is that just because a court document states that someone is an undercover informant for the FBI does not, I, does not mean that that person is an FBI agent, right? In many of these cases, the informant is either an ex-con or someone who themselves is facing prison time. The FBI recruits them first and says, you know, we're either going to give you a deal on your sentence or in some cases pay you as much as $100,000 per assignment. Now go out and find us a terrorist, correct? Exactly right. A lot of these people working for the FBI are not credible. They do, as you say, have criminal records in many cases. Uh, their integrity is, is in question and their ability to tell the truth. Also, we have no way of judging. And because the practice of undercover agent uh, infiltration is shrouded in secrecy, it's something that, again, is not subject to oversight and transparency. Okay, anyway, so <laughs> <laughs> morals of the story. The first edition of the Anarchist Cookbook sucks. Uh, have lots of sex before you get married. <laughs> yes. And the most recent edition of the cookbook called Recipes for Disaster Rocks. Go buy it for a Culte Veritatis podcast. I'm Leon Filger, along with Sage Murray. Ooh, Gallifrey. And in studio with us. Staff. And Richard Bigley. Good night. Love Good. you. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> Already another great episode from Leon. Uh, if you want to check out the Anarchist Cookbook, it's very easy to find online, plus we'll be pointing links to it. Uh, once again, the disclaimer of do not try this at home because the chemistry was written by a 17-year-old that didn't really know what he was talking about is very, very apt. So don't try anything in the book, but it's interesting to leave through. But our palate cleanser this evening is from the artist Fragile Tom and his song Naked Bone. See you in the after show and enjoy.
Welcome to the After Show. I'm Leon Filger, along with... Stage Murray. Good Gallifrey. Uh, we got an email, and I'm going to read it. It's from Miss X. She writes, I wanted to thank Leon for sharing his story. It resonated well with me. My uncle killed himself when, he was, when I was four, and my mom told me that he killed himself because he was sad. So from an early time, I was terrified of being sad because that meant I would have to kill myself. So I always thought I had the idea that suicide was an option. So being depressed or being sad was scary because I knew if it got bad, I could always kill myself. Man. When I was 16, I wrote a note and hadn't decided what I was going to do with it. And my mom found it. I was put in school therapy for suicide risk kids. This was from middle school to high school. When I was in my 20s, I started seeking help for my depression and got meds and they sort of helped. But when I was also becoming a mom, so I was off the meds as much as I was on them. Mm -hmm. After my second son, the meds made me manic, and so that scared me. I was up for days, and I hated it. So I got a new therapist, and we tried herbal and non-prescription remedies. My marriage fell apart, and I moved back home with my aunt and two kids. At this time, my mom's health was getting bad, so my brother and I decided to move in together and take care of her together. A few years after that, she got really bad, and the herbal remedies were not helping anymore. When my mom died, I lost my shit, full-blown psychotic break. Oh, no. But I couldn't let myself be hospitalized because I still had kids to take care of. But I was super paranoid that the earth was no longer able to hold all the human life and creations. I'm from Chicago, so the downtown area is built right off the lake. I was convinced that we had built too much and the whole city would collapse into the water. Yikes. Mm. At my house, we have a tree out front, and I was convinced the tree was growing too fast, and it was going to grow into the house, and the house would collapse. I finally got a new doctor and got prescribed actual meds, and after finding the right cocktail of meds, I started to get better. Four years to the day my mom passed away, we found out that my dad had the same brain cancer that my mom had had and needed surgery to remove the tumor. He had surgery in December and passed away in February, but I adjusted my meds again and I'm finally getting to the point that I'm starting to feel normal again. But I still had to adjust my meds last week because with the depression subsided, the mania came back. Ugh. I was diagnosed with bipolar 2, but I'm more into helping with my health and I can tell when I'm getting depressed or manic or whatever. But I try to share my story with people so they know it's not a lonely thing. So I thank you for sharing your story as well. It made me feel like I really am not alone and there are others out there with stories. Anyway, thank you. I'm so glad that you are doing so much better. Better is good. I love the podcast and how honest everyone is with everything. Cheers, Miss X. Oh, we love you, Miss X. Thank you. Yeah. And I really resonate with that because often like the struggle with balancing your meds with life and like trying to barely hold on and fix yourself until those medications kick in, like mm -hmm. that's often a very private struggle mm -hmm. and it can feel very lonesome. Well, and being um, like having kids, like there's lots of meds that you can't take because your your baby doesn't need your antidepressants through your breast milk or whatever. Yep. So and yeah, there's a lot of like antidepressants and psych meds that are teratogenic and mm -hmm. can, can cause go through. birth defects in your yeah, baby. Yeah, so it's like I I empathize with that. There like, are, tough. are meds that like I had to be careful of because they could have caused defects in my sperm that could have caused problems with baby Leon Filger. Christ. Yeah, like I there's one med that I had to go off because it could have made my semen teratogenic. Yeah. Wow. Crazy, uh, hey? Modern medicine is amazing, but it's also pr playing with huge forces. Like it's the butterfly effects of some chemicals that that pharmacology can give you is is sometimes intimidating. Yeah. But we're really glad that you found a combo that seems to be working. If you ever need anything, we're around. Yeah, shoot us another email. We're yeah, happy to listen. Or slide into our DMs Yeah, on Twitter or whatever. Yeah, and all three of the people in this room, I, I don't know if... We're just doing the after shows, so that's what I meant. Yeah, so all three of the people in this room like are medicated and had to balance stuff out and fight their ways out and experiment and all that, so you're not alone. We're here. Yeah, we're here. All right. We love you. All right, for a call to Veritatis, I'm Ud Gallifrey. Sage Murray. Leon Filger. Have a good night. Love you, bye. Cheers. <laughs>